first female astronaut from the US went to space for a six day space flight, she was given 100 tampons. And then the other part of that story that's less often told is that was the second calculation. The initial calculation was 200 tampons. Oh my God. Most women astronauts in longer duration spaceflight opt for menstrual suppression through oral contraceptives, through IUD. Okay. They opt just not to have their periods. Uh, so space exploration in, in general, historically, has been, um, you know, made around um, male physiology. Um, now, do you feel like, oh, you know, when you're at space, the unique challenges that women face are sort of catered to in your in your um, journey up to space? Yeah, absolutely. I think the fact that the demographic is now slowly diversifying yeah. means that we can't ignore that, you know, we need to consider different body shapes, body types, different physiologies. And so two areas um, that come to mind. So one is obviously menstrual health. Yes. Um, so um, famously or infamously, when Sally Ride, the first female astronaut from the, uh, from the US went to space for a six day space flight, she was given 100 tampons because um, that's what NASA's engineers, all male, calculated at that time that she would need. And I think any woman knows that if you're going through 100 tampons in six days, you need to see a doctor. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. and, and then the other part of that story that's less often told is that was the second calculation. The initial calculation was 200 tampons. Oh my God. Right. So again, you know, they could have just asked a woman. They yeah. could have just had a woman on the team to say, maybe let's reconsider that. Yes. And so um, when we talk about longer duration space flight, yes. orbital space flights, and how menstruation is managed, um, or what the research around that is, is the short answer is we need more data because most women astronauts in longer duration space flight opt for menstrual suppression through oral contraceptives, through IUDs. Okay. They opt just not to have their periods. So there are a number of women who do opt to have their periods in space, but that number is few and far between. So okay. what truly is the impact of the spaceflight environment, the increased stress, the microgravity environment, the high radiation environment, all of those working together synergistically, the answer is we just need more data. We need more women and we need more studies. Yeah. The second area that comes to mind is that women and men are built differently. So the proportions, the stretchiness of our ligaments, um, the angles at which you know, our pelvic bones uh, and our Stretched. Are, exist. Um, they're different. Yeah. And so when it comes to proportions for spacesuits, they're slightly different. The pressure points and the range of motion is going to be different right, for men and right. women. So, you know, it's not one size fits all. Yeah. You can do it. But if you truly want your team to perform, you're going to take their physiology into context. So movement and performance is easier. Oh, that's very interesting. In fact, you answered my next question, which is all going to be about women's health and how it is there. Um, so what are the current best practices that are used for managing mental health when it comes to, uh, you know, people are there, it's, it's a high pressure job. Um, and you feel like, how is it compared to what is available on earth? Yeah, that's a great question. So when we talk about the big five challenges of health in space, we yeah. talk about it as the ridge framework. We talk about radiation, isolation and confinement, distance from earth, altered gravity, and then the environment itself. So exposure to lunar dust on the moon, an altered day-night cycle. If you're on the International Space Station, right. so you're going through 16 sunrise, sunset cycles per 24 hours. So there's a lot going on that can, you know, um, to, that can, coming back to the eye, the isolation and confinement, that refers to mental health. Yeah. So there's a lot that can impact it. You're isolated from your friends and family. So for longer duration missions, there is support in place. There's regular contact with the crew physician back on Earth. There's regular conferences with the uh, crew psychologist. Um, there's regular conferences with friends and family. I would say that folks who go to space, who go to these extreme environments, they self-select. And there's this term in positive psychology called salutogenesis, where it means that we look at adversity as the opportunity to build character, to yes. rise to the occasion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there's folks who look at a mountain and say, that's too hard, I'm gonna go around. And there's folks who look at a mountain and say, I wanna climb that because yeah. I know it'll be hard, but I know it'll make me better. And so when you have this group of people who wanna perform in space flight, you know, the challenge is keeping them performing at their best. So when we talk about mental health, um, this is typically a group who are, you know, 
looking after their own health as well as the health of their crew. They're looking for ways to make the lives of their teammates better, even pre-mission, during the mission, post-mission. Um, and we call that type of behavior expeditionary behavior. And it's, it's true all throughout the exploration world. So I'm also a two-time aquanaut. I've done two underwater missions for totaling over 11 days. Um, and the dynamic there was a little bit different. I was the only woman on a crew of four other men, four other males. Um, and the commonality there is excellence. You genuinely care about each other. You care yeah. about the mission and you want to have do the best possible job at the end of the day. So mental health really, um, coming back to your question, it's about... Um, seeking to look out for yourself as well as your crew yes. and then keep the bigger picture in mind.